morning, church. I want to share a scripture with you. Matthew chapter 13, beginning on verse 3. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Let's pray together. Father, we seek your face as we open your word. We seek you because you are the source of our strength. You are the source of our understanding. You are the source of discernment and clarity. In you, God, there is no confusion. So we seek you, God. Because we desire to know what, what it means that there are different types of people. And as we go out and do our best to be part of the harvest, to bring in the harvest, as you've told us to do, that the seed falls on all different kinds of people. How do we react to all these different kinds of people? Can you teach us what we are to say? Can you teach us what we should not say? So that as each opportunity presents itself, as the Holy Spirit leads us into each opportunity to share our faith and to do our best to bring in the harvest, that we would have the discernment to know what kind of ground we are dealing with. If it is good ground, it immediately produces a good harvest. But is it... A, rocky ground? Is it thorny where we are? This is the image that you gave, Jesus, and we want to discern it correctly. We're asking you, Holy Spirit, to teach each one of us what the parable of the sower actually means and what our particular role is in the harvest as we deal with different types of people that have received the word of the Lord, but they deal with it differently. Would you train us? Would you teach us? Lastly, Father, would you create in us a clean heart? Would you wash our hands that we might have the purity of thought to be able to discern your word rightly. We ask you all of this in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus, our Messiah. In Jesus' name. And you can agree by saying, Amen. And Amen. I do welcome you to another time together in the holy word of the Lord. It is again my honor and my privilege to open the text of scripture with you. We continue on in the Harvest series here in the church. We began this series by simply making sure that we discern that it is harvesting season. We began in John chapter 4, verse 35, Jesus speaking to his disciples, and he says, Do you not say that there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. That the first step to making sure we understand what the harvest is, what he means by sending out laborers into the harvest, is that it is harvesting season. We now are in 
a day and age when the church should be active in the harvest. And the harvest, in its most simplistic form, are the people that do not yet walk fully with Christ. They do not either completely have surrendered their life to walk with Christ, or that they have known him, but they do not walk with him. Whether they have never heard of him, or have heard but have not put action to their faith. This is the harvest. And we have looked at the idea that there is a a rich harvest. There is actually a larger harvest than there are laborers to bring it in. So that's why the Lord is telling his disciples here in John chapter 4, don't you even notice how large the harvest is? The second thing that we looked at in the Harvest series was knowing our particular responsibility in the harvest. If you think of actually bringing in a harvest, there are multiple different roles, there are multiple different things that need to be done. We're all created quite individually. We're very unique. We all have been given different gifts, both natural gifts and spiritual gifts. So it wouldn't be right for us all to try to do the exact same thing the exact same way. This is why we went to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where we see that uh, Paul wrote, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. In other words, there's many different roles in bringing in the harvest. Some have planted seed, some are watering seed, but it'll always be God that changes the heart of an individual. That is not our responsibility. We are not here to manipulate or to... Bombard. We are here to present truth. We are here to love those that need to be loved and to speak when we are called upon to speak and to listen when we are called upon to listen. But it is God that will actually change someone's heart. However, we all have different roles in harvesting. The next thing we covered in this idea of the harvest series after recognizing that it is harvesting season, after recognizing that we need to have our own particular responsibility in bringing in the harvest, we have to address the difficulties. And addressing the difficulties is the idea that there are difficulties. If we go back to what we read in Luke chapter 10, it says, I'm sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves showing us that it is, it is quite dangerous. There are difficulties. And sharing your faith with someone else, if we're honest, can be difficult at times. However, if we are sent by God and the Lord is allowed to speak through us, then the Lord will change the heart. The Lord will affect the person. So we do need to address that there are difficulties. However, we must trust that our good shepherd is sending us out, but he is protecting us as he sends us. So we don't need to be anxious about how to bring in the harvest. We just need to be diligent and faithful to do what the Lord puts in front of us to do. All of that brings us here to what is normally referred to as the parable of the sower, even though the sower is not spoken about hardly at all, except in Matthew 13, 3, a sower went out. That's the end of talking about the sower. The majority of this particular parable is about soil more than sower. We talk about four different types of soil. There's the soil that's in the path, There's the soil that's in the rocks. There's the soil that's surrounded by thorns. And there's the good soil, the rich soil. The path, the rocks, the thorns, and the good. Four different kinds of soil. But one thing we also want to make sure we note is one seed. One seed. It is not just one particular grain of seed. It is that it's it's quality seed. It's good seed put in the path. It's good seed in the rocks. It's good seed in the thorns. And it's good seed in the soil. Because once it reaches good soil, it produces a wonderful crop. Which means it's good seed that was also put in the rocks and in the path and among the thorns. 
So there are really three different things to consider. The sower, the soil, and the seed. What kind of seed are we supposed to be using when we think about this idea of harvesting? Now to break this down so that we can really work our way through this particular text in Matthew 13, let's just take it one step at a time and see what we can learn about the different kinds of people, the different kinds of soil that we are going to encounter and see if we can't come up with four real action items, things that we can actually know in our mind and apply when we have the opportunity to speak about our faith with others, to, to work on this harvest. We need to know what do we do if we meet someone that is in the kind of stuck in the path, if you will, kind of soil? What do we do with the person that we, we discern has got the thorns growing up around them? How do we talk to them? It'll be different than how we speak to someone else. Let's see if we can work through this parable that Jesus said and come out with four real clear things that we can apply as we are sent out to work in the harvest. If we were to begin, the very first place to begin in Matthew 13, 3 is simply the idea where it says a sower went out to sow. The first thing to note in this idea of the sower is that the sower went out. Now, the last time we were together, we looked at this idea of the Greek word hupago, which means to leave or while you are going. And we're gonna go back there now because the first thing that the sower had to do was not just throw seed, but the sower had to go out. The sower went out. It's a reminder again that our role as Christians is not to huddle into the church and stay here. We come here for instruction and we come here to corporately worship our king. We come here to pray together, but we do not come here to hide and to stay. We're not secret Christians. We are then sent out of the church, out of the building, and we are the active church. We're the hands and feet of Christ. So, hupago, to leave, to go, and while we're going, we are affecting the harvest. That's where we start with the sower. The sower had to go out. Are we recognizing that each time that we go from our home or from the church, when we leave, we are entering into the harvest, no matter what we're doing, whether we're just going into the marketplace, we're going to work, wherever we are going, we walk into the harvest. One thing I do want to point out about this is that there is an action item about the idea of going, about being sent off into the harvest. And that is simply this. If you go to Luke chapter 24, verse 49, Jesus is speaking. He's speaking to his disciples and he says, Behold, I'm sending the promise of my father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Now, this is interesting. This is before the disciples had had the tangible Holy Spirit filling them. Jesus tells them, go into the city and wait. Wait for the Holy Spirit. So once you receive this divine, supernatural power, then go. Now, we don't have to wait for the Holy Spirit to... Uh, be in us, he is already in us. They were waiting for the sending of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit already dwells within us. However, it is wise, and our action item would be to be wise enough to pray, Holy Spirit, would you empower me to go into the harvest? Imagine if we prayed this way every morning before we left our home. Before we prayed for someone, because we've already learned that we can pray people into the harvest. This can be done in the secrecy of our home. But imagine if we, before the prayer that leaves our home and leaves into a, 
a outward prayer. There is a prayer that the Holy Spirit would fill us to overflowing, that the Holy Spirit would would consume us so that our words are no longer our own. The Holy Spirit helps us have the right words. The Holy Spirit helps us pray correctly. If we began to pray before we went into the marketplace, before we left our home, that the Lord would fill us, give us the right words, power from on high, then as we went into the harvest, we would be sent just like these disciples are, filled with the Holy Spirit and then actively going into the harvest. So the beginning of a sower went out is a sower was filled up with the seed and then the sower went out. Make sure that you are filled up with the seed before you go out. It would be unwise if the sower went out and left the seed behind. The sower just walked through the fields and accomplished nothing. He's no longer a sower. He's just a man walking through the fields. He's a sower because he has seed. We need to make sure that we pick up the seed every time before we leave and go into the harvest. This is the very first step, is that the sower went out. Now, the second thing, if we go back to Matthew 13, Go to verse 4, and it says, As he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. So the sower leaves and casts seed, and some lands on the path, and we don't know what the path is originally. The disciples, when they heard this parable, they didn't know what the path was. The people hearing this parable didn't know what the path was. This is crucial that we understand that Jesus explained later what the path actually was. If we go farther into Matthew 13, we're, right now we're in verse 3 and verse 4. If you go down to verse 19, you'll see that Jesus actually explains this parable to the disciples. He explains what the path is. He explains what the rocky ground symbolizes. And he doesn't do this to the larger group that actually heard the parable. Because parables are not just simple stories to make a complex message simple. Parables were actually a frustration to the people because it was a story that you might not know the answer to. You might not know what it means. And this is because they weren't listening when Jesus actually did give them divine truth. There were no parables in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus gave divine truth about each individual topic. It is that when people were not heeding his words, he began to speak in parables and they were not fully understanding what he was saying. And only to the disciples did he often explain what the parable meant. Now, we are blessed because we're on the other side of this. It's been written down and we have the parable as the large crowd heard it. But we also have the explanation that Jesus gave to the disciples when they said, we don't know what this means. If you go down to Matthew 13, verse 19, Jesus explains, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. So remember, the large crowd that heard this parable, they didn't know what it fell along the path meant, but the disciples, those that are close to the Lord, they now understand what it meant that certain seed fell along the path. And now we know what it means. We know that the seed that falls along the path is seed where people hear the word of the kingdom, but they don't understand it. This brings us to our very first action item about how do we talk to someone about our faith? How do you and I talk to someone about our faith when we are bringing in the harvest and the Lord 
put someone in our path and they have questions and we want to talk about our faith, the first action item is simply this, don't overcomplicate. Don't overcomplicate. When you're talking about your faith, it is not time for you to show off how much you know about different passages of scripture or to talk about some very deep theological perception that you have just recently heard. Don't overcomplicate. Let it be understandable. Think of it this way. Jesus is the wisest human being to ever walk the earth and no one has ever been able to argue a case with him and confound him. Yet he could confound the wise every time that they tried to attack him verbally with questions or trickery. He was so wise and so discerning that every leader said he's, he is so incredibly wise, except Jesus made it simple. It, it takes true brilliance to not overcomplicate. So when you and I have the opportunity to talk to someone about our faith because they want to know, let's not overcomplicate so that they don't understand this simple yet profound message of hope and life under the covenant of grace provided through Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. First step, don't overcomplicate. This, this goes for you and I as well. In Hebrews 2, verse 1, it says, Therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. When you are listening to Bible teaching, when you are studying the Word of God, you want to make sure that you don't have the seed falling in your own self on the path where you don't understand the word of the Lord. You don't understand biblical teaching. And so instead of trying to pay closer attention, we just blow it off. That's why if you notice when Jesus explained what happened to the seed, he said, the enemy comes and takes it away. That's why Ephesians 4, 27 says, give no opportunity to the devil. It's important that we recognize the devil is trying to undo any harvesting that we are doing. So as the seed is put on the path, this is someone who doesn't really understand, the enemy wants to swoop in quickly and remove that seed so that they just move on with their life. They didn't understand, they move on. What we need to do is make sure we don't overcomplicate the message of grace, the message of hope. We need to make sure that we speak in a way that they understand so that we don't give the opportunity to the devil to come in and take it away. That's the first soil. That's the path. Now let's go to the next piece of soil, and that is the rocky ground. Verse 5 and verse 6 of Matthew 13 other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil. And immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. This is the next section of soil. This is what rocky ground is. Now let's go to the explanation. Remember, Jesus explained to the disciples what rocky ground actually was. If you go down to Matthew 13, verse 20 and 21, he says, as for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. So the rocky ground is one who received the seed, grew up quickly, was ecstatic about following the Lord. However, when tribulation, which will come, Scripture even says that tribulation, hard times will come, when persecution arises, they will fall away. There's no root in Luke chapter 8, when Jesus was explaining this, Luke wrote down in Luke 8, 6, some fell on the rock and it, 
as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. It's rocky ground. There's no moisture to, to get the roots in. Remember, our Christianity is not just all the visual, what everybody sees, how we dress, how we talk, what, what we do. The majority of our Christianity, the majority of our faith is unseen. It's the root system. It's the unseen time in the word of God. It's the unseen time in prayer. It's the secret place. This is where the roots grow down deep. So then as the trials of life come, we have a good root system. If it's all just surface Christianity, going to church, doing the things, talking the language, then it's all surface. There's no depth. There's no root. So when tribulation comes, we just get blown away. There's nothing here holding us in place. And that is considered the rocky ground. So what do we do? What should we and how should we respond to coming up against someone who has a rocky soil in their spirit? They received the word, they were excited about it, but then they had no roots and they, they withered away. Maybe you know someone that originally was excited. Maybe they even came to church with you and they were excited about it and they brought their family and their family was here. Maybe they were here for a short time and then something happened and they withered away. What do we do about that? What is our response? Water what you plant. Again, water what you plant. If you have had the honor, the privilege of planting a seed and seeing someone, or if someone else has done that, as Paul said, I planted, but Apollos watered. If someone comes to your church and then you begin to see them wither away, make sure you're watering what has been planted. This says they withered away because they had no moisture. We need, to, we need to tear away the rocks and we need to pour moisture into this. We need to be there and love these people and walk through life with them. How horrible that the church can quickly fill up and then completely disappear and nobody seems to know where they went. This is, this is the second part that Jesus points out about harvesting is we have seen people come and walk with the Lord and then wither away. Have you done anything about that? Is there any action? Have you pursued to water what was planted? Because it is not just a massive crusade to have everyone say one prayer and then to leave them alone. This isn't maturity. The sinner's prayer is first off not even in the scriptures. To have someone just say one prayer and that is it, is immature. It is a lifestyle. It is a dying to oneself and being reborn and then being discipled and loved and have fellowship with your fellow brothers and sisters. This takes effort on everyone's part. So if we can see those that were excited and then they withered away, Often it's because there was no moisture, there was no discipleship, there was no reaching out, there was no going and listening and letting them talk through things and having the time investment to listen and to counsel and to bring back to life this seed. We didn't invest in moisture, so there were no roots. This is the rocky ground. Next is the weeds or the thorns, it says. Verse seven, other seed fell among thorns and the thorns grew up and choked them. Again, remember, everyone hearing this, the large group, they have no idea what the thorns mean. They can think and ponder what they think they might mean, but Jesus explains exactly what these thorns represent but he said this only to his disciples and now we have it in Luke 8, 14. The explanation says, as for what fell among the thorns, 
They are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. Matthew 13, 22, when Jesus was explaining it, as for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. The deceitfulness of riches. We live in a day and a time where false prophets are so blatantly obvious and yet we still, it still happens, it's active, it's constant. You can see on your own television screen or across your own computer, people that claim to be Christians and they claim to be apostles or prophets or teachers. And what they'll tell you is exactly this idea of riches, riches and pleasures of life, health and wealth. This is the benefit of Christianity, so they say. So they push the benefits of Christianity, riches and health. They'll tell you, if you come to know the Lord and if you give to the kingdom of God through their particular ministry, you will be wealthy and you will be healthy. These are the, the guises that they're using wealth. As we see here, the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. Often, when we think about being part of bringing in the harvest, one way to bring in the harvest is to just try and brag about all the benefits of Christianity. The issue with that is that the benefits of Christianity are not what you might think they are because what's being sold right now is the benefit of Christianity is wealth and health, which it doesn't take very long for you to figure out after being in that particular church or donating to that particular ministry that it doesn't work. You do not become a wealthy person immediately and you might not become immediately healthy by just donating to a particular ministry. And so it chokes out the real word of God because we've got this false image that the whole reason we're following God is just for these fleshly benefits. This is inappropriate. It chokes out the word. So if you think that the true benefits of being a follower of Christ are things like being at peace in the midst of trial and that the major benefit to Christianity happens when this life is over. Now this actually will stand the test of time because when you look back at the 11 apostles that followed Jesus, 10 out of those 11 were martyred for their faith. There was no health or wealth for any of them and they walked with God. So it becomes a cliche, health and wealth, as if that will bring in the harvest, it will bring in, but it will be the wheat, it'll be these thorns that grow around the wheat and choke it out. It will not last. It never lasts because it's not real. So what is the action item? What should we learn from this? So far, our action items have be, been things like don't overcomplicate. They've They've been things like water what you plant. What's the action item for the thorns? Don't push the benefits. Don't push the benefits. When you're talking to someone about your faith, instead of trying to sell it like a car salesman, trying to sell the gospel, notice Jesus never tried to sell the gospel. Instead of trying to push the benefits of Christianity, push the sacrifice of your faith. Be real with people. Say, it's, it's hard to be a Christian. 
It is. It takes a giving up of oneself. It takes a following of a very narrow path. It it is the greatest thing you'll ever do. It might be the hardest thing you ever do. This is exactly what Jesus said. The, The largest community listening that we have on record with Jesus is right after he fed the 5,000, which we, we believe to be around 30,000 people because it only said that they counted the men, not the women and their children. So there's upwards of 25 to 30,000 people that ate off of those loaves and fish. It's the next day even more people gathered. They all were coming in to listen to what Jesus had to say because they wanted more food And Jesus having the largest crowd, the picture the largest church we can build. And the message that he gives is that it's hard to follow him. It's difficult to follow him. And that he's not going to give them more food. And that the real food needs to be the satisfaction of their spirit, not their bellies. And he says it takes sacrifice to really follow. And that one sermon They all seemed to leave, and the only that remained were those that were faithful and mostly just the apostles. We would consider that the most unsuccessful sermon ever given. And that's what Jesus, the wisest man to walk the earth, the very Son of God, when he had the opportunity to speak to the largest crowd, he did not push the benefits. He pushed the sacrifice. Because he knows that this, this is the truth that will actually produce a real, authentic follower of Jesus Christ. So when you and I have the opportunity to go out and to witness to others, to speak to others, whether in the marketplace, in work, at school, wherever you are, on the phone, praying for others, instead of just talking about the benefits as if we are to sell something, Don't push the benefits. Talk about who Jesus is. See, truth is attractive. Truth is attractive, even though truth is often very hard. That's where we want to find ourselves. Think of it this way. In 1 Timothy 6, verse 5, Paul's writing to Timothy, and he said, These certain people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content." But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. We do not push the benefits. What we push is truth. It is reasonable. We are are intellectuals. We are not fools. It is a wise thinker that knows that nothing cannot create something. We know that there is a creator. And we know who he is. And we know that the word of God has been proven true. That the 6,000 years of history that are covered in The Old Testament alone have been proven to be fact and truth. We know that Jesus was a real man. The history books tell us that he fulfilled the prophecies that came hundreds of years before him. That his death on the cross was prophesied over 800 years earlier. That he issued in a new covenant between God and man. These are true statements. We are reasonable people. So we don't need to sell Jesus, we explain Jesus, and the truth will set you free. Truth. Not pushing the benefit package 
Lastly, we have good soil. Verse 8 and verse 9, other seed fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Once we reach good soil, immediately it produces a good harvest. Here's what we can learn from that. That means that the seed that the sower was using was good seed all along. The seed that the sower was using that he put in the path was excellent seed. The seed that landed in the thorns and in the rocks, excellent seed. Because when that same exact seed, it doesn't say he used different seed, in that exact same seed, when it did hit good soil, it produced an excellent harvest. So here's our last point. When we're talking to others, make sure you're using good seed. In other words, use the scriptures. Use the scriptures. See, in the explanation, when Jesus was explaining to the disciples about what this parable meant in Luke 8, 11, he said, the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. When we have the honor and the opportunity to share our faith, use the scriptures, not your opinion, not your political view, use the scriptures. Because if we add our opinion, we throw in weed seed to mix into this. If we use a political bend, we're using junk seed. No, that's foolish. Use the scriptures. It is written. That's how Jesus often talked. It is written. That's what we say. The word of God has been proven true. It's still the most read book in history and in the world. It's still the most sold document ever in recorded history. It's true. And it's beautiful because Jesus actually said, if you use my word, if you use that seed, instead of trying to manipulate your own ideas of how you should talk to someone, if you use the word of God, he said, it won't return void. If you use the word of God, when you're talking to someone, it, it won't return empty. We found that scripture in Isaiah 55, verse 10 and 11. It says, for as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. It shall succeed. It will succeed. That's what God said. Use the scriptures. Use perfect seed. Remember what Hebrews 4.12 says the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It's piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It's exactly what we're dealing with here. Use the scriptures. You should know some key scriptures by heart so when the Lord gives you the opportunity to share your faith, you can just pull these out. You don't have to pull out your Bible, you can just know, look, the word of God says, and this is true. God said it. He wrote it. We don't have to modernize the message. We don't have to modernize even the method in which we share. We don't have to move the, the landmark that we've been given and has been there since the beginning. There's a beautiful scripture in Proverbs 22, 28 that says, do not move the ancient landmark that your father has set. Don't move the ancient landmark that your fathers have set. We don't need to modernize the message. Give good seed. That's what we want to do. Don't overcomplicate it. Make sure that you're watering 
what you've planted. Don't just push the benefits and make sure that you use good seed. Use the scriptures. Four things that we can learn from four different types of soil. Because the first thing we want to do is make sure we fill up our satchel with good seed. Make sure that you pray that the Lord would work in you and through you no matter when you leave. So whoever the Lord puts into your path, you have good seed ready. You're not here to overcomplicate it. You're not here to just throw seed in their faith and never speak to them again. You're not here to just push the benefits and try to sell Jesus by pushing all of these fictitious things about our faith. And you're not here to offer someone just your opinion because no one needs your opinion. No one needs your political bend. What people really need is Jesus. They need the word of God because that is the only thing that will actually give the growth. Remember, some of us are planting, some of us are watering. It'll always be God who gives the growth. God will change their heart. It is just our job not to move the ancient boundary marker. Give them quality seed. And if it lands in good soil, it will produce what God originally intended. Father, we thank you that you have already had the foresight to see what is in front of us. You have ordained our steps. You know what today holds and you also know what tomorrow holds. You are the orchestrator. You are our conductor. This is your symphony and we follow you. We're honored to be the musicians in your piece. But we follow you. We submit to you. We ask that you would send the Holy Spirit to continue to fill us so that we have good seed that we are ready to cast to whatever soil is presented. We're not going to overcomplicate it. We're not going to leave it dry. We're not going to try and push fictitious benefits that aren't actually true because the true benefits are far more majestic than just foolish wealth and health for just a few years. God, would this parable become awakened in our spirit so that we would then be better harvesters being sent out and we would sow good seed and we would reap good seed this is our request. And lastly, Father, as we seal this time, sealing these thoughts in our mind and into our spirit, we all together, we speak to you and we follow the outline of prayer given to us by our king. When our king was here, he taught us to pray. And we follow this now as we all speak together by saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God bless.
bless you all.